Hey, good work. Good work, Barry Bobby. Yeah. All right. So, last unit of the semester, momentum. So, momentum is actually what uh, what Newton was talking about when he was talking about forces and acceleration and all. And momentum is the oomph that objects carry. Separate from kinetic energy, it is quite simply the mass of a thing multiplied by its velocity. Oh, is it, is it magnets in there? Yes. Okay. There are opposing magnets in, uh, in the carts and on the ends, too. Oh, there we go. Like what? What the hell? Yeah, these are these are like the cars you have. Did they? This was generation one. You have generation two. These are uh, two fifty instead of half kilograms. But momentum is a mass times a velocity. It is given the letter p, little p, and it's equal to mass times velocity, and it's also equal to force times time. So when something is moving, like the blue car. When something is moving, it has momentum. When it collides with something, it has what's called impulse. And then the impulse becomes momentum again. So right now, this car has neither impulse, impulse nor momentum. The blue car has momentum, momentum, impulse, momentum, momentum, impulse, momentum. So momentum is what you get during collisions. Sorry, impulse is what you get during collisions. Momentum is what you have when you have an object that has mass and also has velocity. Now understand that momentum can be two-dimensional, but we're going to focus on one-dimensional momentum. How are you getting that? What is? Oh, so you watch dots collide? Yes. Well, okay. In a line, objects will come together in a line. So this car eats this car in a line. Um, so. Balls can strike at like, glancing collisions, like in a cue ball. In fact, we'll talk about billiards a lot. It's like, you know, um, but we're going to focus primarily on momentum. Okay, so here's the crazy thing about Newton and, and the laws that we, we write. We say talk about first law, inertia. Second law, F equals ma. Third law, uh, for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. Newton talked about momentum. He said that the time rate change of momentum is equal to forces, not F equals MA, F equals the time rate change of momentum. And if you have ca calculus, you know what time rate change is, it's dt, you know, derivatives of time. But uh, this is the practical application of all of Newton's laws. Okay, if there's any questions, now would be a good time to ask. Jump right in. Pretty small unit, not a lot to oh. not a lot to get into, but are we good? Yes? Question? No. No, okay. So just like in the diagram, this is actually kind of interesting. When one object of a certain mass strikes another object of the same mass, all the momentum gets transferred. Isn't that crazy? That is called an elastic collision. In reality, the only place you see truly elastic collisions is at the atomic level. But with our cars here, this is pretty close to an elastic collision. Blue car has kinetic energy, because it's moving, and it comes to a rest. What's the kinetic energy when something has zero velocity? Zero, because again, there's one half of B squared. So blue car has kinetic energy. Now red car has kinetic energy, and blue car has zero. Now red car has kinetic energy. Now red is zero, and blue is not zero anymore. Okay, so. Sometimes energy is conserved, sometimes it's not. Momentum is always conserved. So that was an elastic collision. In an elastic collision, all the energy transfers from one body to another body. In an inelastic collision, momentum will be transferred, but energy will not be. So these things have Velcro and they stick together. So they're going to go stick, and they're going to stick together. Okay. So the question I have for you is this. Red car is going to be sitting at the 100 centimeter mark, and blue car is going to be cruising along, and they're going to go and stick. 
What are they going to do at that point? They're going to keep going. Yeah, they're going to keep moving. Same speed as before? No. 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 Yeah, they're going to keep moving, but they're going to move slower. Okay. So that is an inelastic collision. Inelastic collisions happen when objects stick or come apart. So an elastic, perfect uh, transfer, inelastic, they stick. Oh, there we go. Momentum is the real Newton's second law. So momentum mv is a vector quantity. So again, momentum is a vector. So it has both magnitude and direction. Doesn't tell you. It can be positive or negative. It can be along the x-axis, along the y-axis, or so on. Force is the time rate change momentum. That was what what uh, Newton wrote. Come on. So, if you multiply both sides of F equals MA by delta T, you get a new unit, and that is impulse. Impulse is what you have during a collision. Now, obviously, the time is usually very small. And it's super annoying, but the letter we use for impulse is capital J. Because of this, you rarely even see it used. Because what do we usually use capital J for? Joules. Joules, exactly. Um, and energy is a big part of momentum. So I don't know who it was who decided, let's make it a capital J. Um, but you rarely even see it used as a capital J because capital J is usually used joules, but that is the unit. So like I said, when something's moving, it has mass and velocity. During a collision, it has impulse. And you can say like, momentum, impulse, momentum, momentum, impulse, and momentum, it keeps switching back and forth. So impulse is force times time. The amount of force that is exerted, as an average, multiplied by the time of collision, will be the impulse. Now, if nothing is lost, the amount of momentum is exactly equal to the impulse. So let's just say that this had one, oh, this is the fun part. The unit for momentum doesn't have a named unit. Yeah, since we named force after Newton, no one could decide what we should name momentum after. Wow. Well. <laughs> Sometimes science just doesn't make any sense. Maybe we're going to name it after you someday. Who knows? Um, but until then, it's the kilogram meter per second. Oh. Yeah. So the unit for momentum is the kilogram meter per second. Kilogram, mass, meter per second. Velocity. So if this car, let's say this had one kilogram meter per second of momentum, then this car would have one kilogram meter per, per second of momentum, and this car would have one kilogram meter per second of momentum. How much is the impulse? One. Yeah. It's plus one for the red car and minus one for the blue car. So if it goes, I have one unit of momentum during collision that one unit of momentum gets arrested to zero, so it would have a momentum or have an impulse of minus one, where the red car has zero momentum, so it would have an impulse of plus one. Then it would have an impulse or momentum of one. Make sense? So impulse is the transfer mechanism of momentum. Oh, by the way, the uniform impulse, Newton seconds. What would be the impulse when it hits like the edge of the bouncing back. Same. So, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so yeah. So if it went in with one and it came back with negative one, it would have an impulse of negative two. Does that make sense? So excellent question. So if positive is that direction, negative is that direction, if it goes in with a momentum of one and comes back with a momentum of negative one, then the impulse would be negative two. Is that clear? All right, car crashes. Why do we have crumple zones and airbags and seat belts? Or car crashes, of course. So if you got us some momentum, uh, the impulse is gonna be FT, right? By the way, what kills you in a car crash? When all of your internal organs take a rib cage. Mm, that's not bad. There's one particular internal organ that's important though. Brain. Brain. Yeah. So what kills you in a car crash is not getting crushed by the car. 
It's not getting impaled by whatever devices are in the car. It's the front of your brain sloshing into the inside front of your skull. That's what kills you. Um, and that's what we want to slow down. So if you, bam, um, if without an airbag and a seatbelt, when the car stops moving, you keep going. And the, 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 the windshield is still there. So eventually your face hits the windshield. It stops very quickly. And your brain, which is right behind your face, slams into your skull very quickly. We want to reduce the amount of time it takes for the front of your brain to slosh into the front of your skull. So that's what the seatbelts and the airbags are for. It slows you down. It's a big old pillow in front of you. So if without a seatbelt, the time for collision as the, your face strikes the windshield is very small. So what can you say about the force of the front of your skull or the front of your brain hitting the back of the front of your skull? It's big. It's big, yeah. So without a seatbelt, this is why we tell you, this is why your parents tell you to wear a seatbelt. Without a seatbelt, the time of your brain sloshing into the front of your face is small. So the force is really, really big. Now, do that same scenario, but wear a seatbelt and have an airbag in front of you. The time to slow to a stop is what? Bigger. Considerably, considerably bigger. I can't even make a, I can't even make the magnitude on the screen. It would be like, the T would be like gigantic. Instead of hitting, instead of stopping in like a hundredth of a second, you stop in like a tenth of a second. Sometimes even longer. So the time to slow to a stop is much larger. So if the time to slow to a stop is much larger, the force is smaller. And one of the fun activities that we're going to do at the conclusion of this unit is to create a device that will cushion an egg. So I'm printing, I'm printing new ones uh, this year. This is last year's egg car. And you're going to put an egg in right here. This has got wheels. It cruises along. Okay. So this is last year's. Um, the new one has holes all over it, so you can anchor things to it. And you're going to put an egg right here. And you're going to slide it down a slit. And it's going to go, and it's going to stop. Now, if you don't do anything to it, it's going to stop and bounce off or stop and hit hard. That's what a lot of cars do. It actually hit and bounce because that's what metal does. Um, so it goes bonk, and the egg is gonna go smash, or it's gonna fly out or something. Right? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna modify your car, your egg car, which I will give you on Monday. I'll give you your egg car, um, Monday after Thanksgiving. And you can modify it in some way to hopefully save your egg. And there's a trophy. I even made the, the egg car trophy. Um, I don't remember who, who won it last year. It might have, yeah, it doesn't matter. Anyway. Um, and uh, this is one of the cars. You can still see parts of the egg from last year right there. So this is one of the cars they made. They took um, some uh, foam or uh, some, some sponge. I don't know if they wetted it down or not. They probably did. Yeah, they probably did. Um, and they sent it down the track and it went boom. And then it probably protected the car a little bit. They put some felt in here, some pipe cleaners. Um, yeah. Oh, and the bottom is falling. <laughs> the bottom is delaminating. That's fun. I'll fix that. Anyway, this is one. This is one I found from last year. I think the rest of them went home, but whoever had this one did not claim it. They're like, you can keep it. Um, but I got the new ones printing right now. So that's what we're gonna do. What your your job is to determine through experimentation how you can create a system that will slow down the impact and protect your egg as well as possible for as least mass as possible. There's lots of different, now, notice we're not doing a, a conventional egg drop. Did anybody do an egg drop in elementary or middle school? A couple of you did. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about, right? If you watch the video by Mark Rober on YouTube, it shows you, like, how to do the perfect egg drop. Yeah, because of that, thanks, YouTube, um, we're not doing a conventional egg drop. We're not dropping from a ladder. We're doing it in a car. The egg is going to pretend to be your skull, and down it goes. And again, you're going to score points based on how far you travel in the vertical direction, with an intact egg divided by the mass you choose. So obviously you could be like, I'm just gonna create a giant football of foam. Um, no, because that would be too heavy. But that's what's coming. That's what we're doing at the end of the unit. All right, questions? Impulse momentum. So this might require some calculators and a whiteboard. 
A 200 kilogram uh, or 2200 kilogram truck is traveling at 35 meters per second. You know what I'm going to ask, right? Yes. What is <laughs> what is momentum exactly? 2200 kilogram truck is traveling at 35 meters per second. What be its momentum? <laughs> I don't know. I took it off first. I'm going to get Q back. I'm going to Q back so I can go. I need to go back a second so I can switch out the display type and then bring up other windows. Remember, I have to do this every single one. Slideshow, settings, 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 setup slideshow, and window. There we go. Okay. Now I can open up the slideshow, and at the same time, I can open up the picker wheel. Hey, you know that looks like Wee! Wee! How did you do that? Lag. Come on, lag. Ah. All right, there we go. Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel, I, uh... Picker wheel, spin the wheel, spin the wheel app. Spin the wheel CC, there we go. Spin the wheel app. <laughs> Alright. For reasons that I don't know, there's like I can't find a quick just delete everything about me. Uh, do this. Control A backspace Control A backspace. Ah, cool. That's kind of like slide, 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 slide. All right, so. Whoa, whoa, I need to open. Open. There we are. Before you. Yeah, what is the question? Okay. 2200 kilogram truck traveling at 35 degrees or 35 meters per second. Seventy-seven thousand. Sounds good. Um, so seventy-seven thousand. Uh, Twenty-two hundred times thirty-five. We've got seventy-seven thousand kilogram meter per second of uh, of momentum. How much force must the brakes apply to stop the truck in six seconds? So we've got seventy-seven thousand kilogram meter per second. And if the brakes stop it for six in six seconds. How much force does it apply? Bang on your calculator for a second. Um, You're breaking the chemical bonds. What are you doing? Yes. Breaking the chemical bonds. Great. Great. I don't know why. I don't know why the bar is messed up. Six seconds. So F. Brand new generator, go. Ruby, how much force is it going to take? Is 77,000. The time is six seconds. Time is six seconds. Momentum is 77,000. No. So our formula is momentum is force divided by time. Or sorry, force times time. You do force divided by time. So the force would be the momentum 
delta B divided by the time, delta T. 77,000 divided by 6? 12,833. Yeah. 12, 12, okay, so about 12,800. And the unit here would be newtons. So it is force, newtons. So 12,833 newtons if the car or the truck brings itself to a stop in six seconds. What if it hits a tree and it collapses the front of the truck in 0.19 seconds? Then how much force is exerted on the truck? No, no, you're dead. <laughs> you're like, well, maybe. Yeah, We're talking like about the truck. truck. I'm, sure that, I'm sure it's a modern truck with an airbag and I'm sure you put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Rolling. Instead of six seconds, if the thing came to a stop in 0 0.19, one nine seconds, oh. how much force is exerted on the truck? Uh, 405,000. 405,000 uh, okay, 405, newtons. So this is why you don't stop your truck by hitting a tree. Oh, oh, so we took you around the so whole time. What you're saying is with no couple zone, no airbag, and no seatbelt, and no screw. Very. Yeah. So oh, wear your seatbelt, have an airbag. No. Oh yeah, child accepted. Like either of those things. What are you driving? A go kart? 1971 Mustang. Oh jeez. Yeah. 2012. Yeah. 2012. You don't even have a seatbelt. Okay. Install seatbelts. I'm pretty sure you're, you're not road legal. Well, no, it's it's a lap belt, and it has a seatbelt now, but if you pull on it, it just falls out. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what pulls? Let's, let's make some upgrades. Yeah. Bring, it, you know bring your vehicle to Because I'm sure you're a great driver. I'm sure you're an excellent driver. It's all the other wackos out there that are on their phone all the time. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you might want to make some upgrades, because I don't want you to die. I especially don't want you to fall into a coma and be in a coma for months, because I'm going to be paying for your health care. I'm a citizen of Nevada. If you could fall into a coma, I mean, paying for you. I don't want to do that. Okay, so this is important. Imagine two vehicles in a head-on collision. Does the force on the left car equal the force on the right car? Does it matter? No, it does not. And yes, they do. Exactly. So for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So because they have the same impulse. They have to have the same time of collision. They have to have the same force. So Newton just didn't just go, yeah, the forces, they should be equal. It has to, has to work that way. No, he rationalized that because if you have two colliding bodies, the time of collision with one and the other have to be the same. One doesn't take longer to collide. So they have to have the same collision time. So if they have the same collision time, they have to have the same force. And then the question you asked and I asked is, does it matter that one is more massive than the other? It does not. It's like the, the chair thing. Exactly. Yeah, it's like the chair when we push the chair. So it doesn't matter that one thing is more massive. I mean, this one of them could be filled with sand or mud. It wouldn't matter. As long as they're colliding together, their time of collision is the same, so their force has to be the same. So impact time is the same, therefore force is the same, therefore impulse is the same. So we're kind of working backwards with what, with what uh, Newton came up with. Okay. Does their change in velocity, is their change in velocity the same? Well, I guess it depends on their initial velocity. Exactly. It depends on their initial velocities. So they might have the same, if they have the same in velocity, they might have the same change in velocity, but the change in velocity is not necessarily the same. Everything else is though, except for mass, obviously. So the change in velocity, does the acceleration of the left car equal the acceleration of the right car? Huh. Think about that. Yeah. 
about that one for a second. Acceleration. Or the negative acceleration, if you'd like. Does the negative acceleration of one car equal the negative acceleration of the other car? No. No. Why? Because if the change of velocity is different, the change in acceleration. That makes sense. Um, and even does, does that make sense? That if the change in velocity is different, then the change of acceleration would be different too, because the time of collision is exactly the same. Also, since the force on both cars is the same, if their mass is different then their accelerations have to be different too. So what if you take it, what if you extended it way out and uh, to like a bug, got kind of like a dragonfly cruising along, goes into the freeway and a car just wipes it out. Smash! Does the force of the car on the bug equal the bug on the car? Yeah. Yeah. They're still colliding. The force is still the same. But cars are so much more massive. Yeah, the car has so much more mass, so its negative acceleration is practically, yeah, it's negligible, but not zero. And because the mass of the bug is so small, its acceleration is considerable. Make sense? Okay. You can find this. Go, go play football and find someone way bigger than you and run right into them you will find that you might accelerate backwards. You might have so much negative acceleration that you might uh, accelerate backwards and that other guy might just kind of run over you. His, his acceleration might not change much at all. In fact, that's one of the exercises we're gonna do. Why, what? Okay, so here's the rules. I mentioned this a couple times. Here's the rules of momentum. Momentum must be conserved in a closed system. So this might be a new phrase. Closed system means a system where objects, energy, and momenta do not enter or leave the system. Okay. For instance, this right now is a closed system. If I give the blue car a uh, oomph, it's no longer a closed system. Now it is again. Now it's a closed system again. It's still a closed system. If I stop it, it's not a closed system. So when we tend to give things a push to get them going, it's not a closed system until we let it go. Now it's a closed system. I got it backwards a bit. Yeah, I got it backwards. That's where there. So, not a closed system, closed system, not a closed system, closed system. So, a closed system is one where objects, forces, energy do not enter or leave the system. If we are interacting with it, it's not a closed system. It's just doing something, then it's a closed system. And uh, this is the conservation of momentum, probably the most important concept in all of cosmology and the universe, is whatever momentum exists in the system at any time must exist in the system at all times. Momentum is conserved at all times. Want to see a video? Sure. Sure. Let's see how lucky we are with this thing. Since I've gone entirely to YouTube, things are a little tricky. Sometimes they work. But you might before you do. I recorded the videos and then Oh, what the? Okay, that's different. I recorded the videos and then I uh, embedded the videos as actual videos. Uh, so the PowerPoint files were enormous. But, uh, that's so weird. Top left? Yes. Top left? Press YouTube on top left. Okay, yeah, I was going to ask. Is it just going to let me go to it? Nope. Okay. Yeah, that's the way. This is famous. So it's chip shot. So chipshot.com was one of the companies that died in the big tech boom, tech boom and bust, um, before you were born. The dot com bubble? Uh, yeah, the dot com bubble. The chip shop was one of them that ended up dying in the dot com bubble. The dot com, what did you say, top com? The dot com, dot com bubble. There you go. The best part is it gets funnier every time you see it. Yeah. 
Scrum Master class in Fall. It's slow. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good, good question. Let's go slow over here. Half. Let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I barely sound motivated now. I think. Slower. Okay, okay. Well, last time, just put it like twice. I guess I should. Okay. No. Time to do it myself. So, chipshot.com. One of the many, one of the, the, the many uh, boom and bust things just disappeared. All right. So back to this. Okay, so um, I mentioned this at the beginning of the class that energy is not necessarily conserved. Momentum is always conserved, but energy is not necessarily conserved. You might have a elastic collision where all the energy of one body transfers to all the energy of another body. Or you can have an inelastic collision where objects stick or break up, and that is a loss in energy. Okay, so here's examples of uh, elastic collisions. This is actually kind of interesting. So I saw numerous times that if you have one object of the same mass striking another object of the same mass, the first one comes to rest. A really good break in billiards is when the cue ball comes to a rest, right in the middle of the table. Watch what happens, and, and the rest of them go flying. Watch what happens when a more massive attacking car strikes a less massive target car. The more massive one chases it. See it again? Off it goes, the more massive keeps going. And then if a less massive attacking car strikes a more massive target car, the less massive rebounds backwards. Still transfer momentum, but it goes backwards. Okay. Axes, axes are important. Having a positive value and a negative value is important. Okay, so elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. Again, that crazy looking triangle E is a sigma, means the sum of all the kinetic energies before equals the sum of all the kinetic energies after. Directions are not important for kinetic energies. Energies are not vectors, so we don't care what direction they're going. All we care about is all the energy uh, before the collision of all the objects is all the energy after the collision. And again, uh, I think this is a test question. The only place that true elastic uh, collisions happen are at the atomic level. Billiards is close. But billiards still, uh, the molecules will flex a little bit and give off sound. So you lose a little bit of energy. The only place where it actually happens is at the atomic level. And then this two-dimensional collision, these are not taught at the first year physics level. So just linear collisions. Then inelastic collisions, objects may stick together. They may gain or lose mass. They may break into multiple pieces. Energy is lost in the collision. So the kinetic energy before the collision is larger than the kinetic energy after the collision. So this would be an inelastic collision where body number one gained mass, body number two gained mass, you know, those pieces flying off, um, but uh, that's an inelastic collision. Okay. If you're with me so far, give me a thumbs up. If you have questions, wave them around. Moving wrong, moving wrong. Okay. All right, so you like formulas, right? Some people love formulas. Some people don't like formulas. I'm not a big formula fan, but if you like formulas, you look at the mass of one, one of one body, and the mass of a second both body, and you simply add their momentums together. So momentum before the collision is just P1 plus P2, with negatives taken into account, and the momentum after the collision is just P1 final plus P2 final. And if you like big equations, then this is the equation for uh, 
two, two body collision. Momentum of the first body plus momentum of the second body equals momentum final of the first body plus momentum final of the second body. All right, questions? You're watching the gerbil? Here. Yes. I've, I've got another version of the gerbil here. <laughs> Never die in normal ways. <laughs> There's always a story. What was that? What C was that from? So that that collision of the right there. Was Probably it, gravity. I think. I, I think so. Yeah, gravity. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Okay. All right. So let's finish the day by, by doing this. You roll a six kilogram bowling ball down a lane at ten meters per second. The ball strikes a one kilogram pin at rest causing it to move backwards at 20 meters per second. Now, backwards meaning the same direction as the initial ball. Um, what's the momentum of the bowling ball? How much momentum does the pin gain? Now, in doing momentum exercises, um, I like to make a table because if you're dealing with only two object momentum, making tables is actually kind of handy. So what I do is I say, all right, I got uh, mass of the first object, or mass of one, mass of two. I got velocity of one. I got velocity of two. I got momentum of one. I got momentum of two, pretend that's a two. I got momentum of two, and then I have total momentum, PT. So this is all before. This is before collision. This is after collision. And then once again, after collision, I'm going to have momentum or mass of one, velocity of one, momentum of one, mass of two, velocity of two, and momentum of two. Only now it's going to be PF, P1F, D1F, because they're fine. Okay. So far, so good? Right. So let's go ahead and fill this up. Six kilogram bowling ball. So mass is six kilograms. It's moving at 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second. That gets to the momentum. So in your head, what's the momentum of the bowling ball? 60. 60. And the volume wall is 60 kilogram meter per second. The pin. What's the mass of the pin? 1.0 kilograms. What's the velocity, initial velocity of the pin? Zero. Zero. Zero meters per second. And that gives it a momentum of zero. Zero meters per second. So all the momentum in the entire system is how much? 60. So the pin has no momentum. The ball has momentum. So all momentum is 60 kilogram meter per second. And that is the same momentum before the collision and after the collision. So let's fill in the second part. Mass of the ball, still six. Mass of the pin, still one. Now what other information does it give us? The velocity of the pin. It tells us the velocity of the pin is 20 meters per second in the direction of the ball. So that tells us the momentum of the pin is how much? 20 kilogram meter per second. How much momentum is then left for the ball? 40. 40. Does everybody see how it's 40? Nod your head if you, I see how white, white is 40. No. Okay, so the total momentum before the collision was 60 kilogram meter per second. After the collision, the pin now has some of that momentum. The pin has gained 20 kilogram meter per second momentum, leaving only 40 kilogram meter per second of momentum for the ball. Okay. Because the total momentum has to be the same. It doesn't change. And this class, it's always two objects. In the future, who knows? So now we can solve for the velocity. What's the velocity of the ball? It came in at 10, and it kept going after hitting the pin with how much? 40, whatever 60 divided by 40 is. Close. Is it 40 divided by 60? Whatever 40 divided by 6 is. Because again, oh, this is six, equal yeah. to M1, V1, final. 6.6. Six 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 point seven six six yeah meters per second. So the final velocity of the ball is six point seven meters per second. 
That is what's left. And it should make sense conceptually that the ball comes in at 10 and keeps going at 6 after it dumps a little bit of momentum into the pin. So momentum of the bowling ball, 20. How much momentum did the pin gain? 20. The ball lost 20. And then we can determine the new velocity of the bowling ball by just figuring out how much momentum it lost. Anybody still here? No, nope, they've all graduated. Was that four years ago? Yes. Three or four. Yeah. Did I see uh, Willie and Jason up there? Yeah. I'm thinking they were freshmen at the time. They might have been. Because, like, the, the ball returns are not blue. Well, they painted them? Yeah, they're red now. Oh. Oh, this is the Orleans. Oh, is it? Yeah. They have above ground ball returns? Uh, Maybe that's at the Orleans. I think the next picture is home. Yeah. This there's, there's this probably yeah this is probably um, Boulder Bowl okay. yeah with the, the benches yeah the Orleans is probably where the championship was because this is the NIAA trophy yeah okay um, cool so far all right so inelastic collisions are more basically work the same way most people find inelastic collisions even easier because an inelastic collision these two velocities are the same. So for an inelastic collision where objects stick together, the velocities v1 final and v2 final, they're the same. Unless this happens. So okay, for, let's, start, let's start with an actual inelastic collision. So an inelastic collision, one object comes in and they stick. There's also something called a reverse inelastic collision, where this happens. In a reverse inelastic collision, they start with zero momentum, and whatever momentum this guy gets, this guy gets too. When they break apart. We're going to be investigating both, both in simulation and in lab. Okay. So perfect example of an inelastic collision is when a bullet strikes a target and gets embedded in, this, in, the, uh, in the device. This is actually called a ballistic pendulum. We don't have one, but they're pretty cool. You like launch something into a cup of clay and it gets stuck in the clay and the whole thing swings. Yeah, pretty neat. But that uses pendulums and we don't study pendulums anymore. So, a perfect inelastic collision is when the two things stick together. There's also a reverse inelastic collision where they separate apart. Reverse inelastic collision. The timing is terrible. Got a few minutes. Here we go. A 350 gram tennis ball strikes a wall at 40 meters per second and rebounds at 30 meters per second in the opposite direction. Can you conceptualize this? It looks like this. Here comes the ball at 40, it rebounds at 30. So its initial velocity is plus 40, its ending velocity is negative 30. What am I going to ask? I got a mass of a ball, I got an initial velocity and a final velocity. What am I going to ask? The force at which it hit the wall. Eventually. But initially, What's the change in velocity? No. A change is final minus initial. So the final velocity is negative 30. The initial velocity is 40. What is the change in velocity? Negative 70. Negative 70. If something goes in positive and comes back negative, it's still final minus initial. Negative 30. Minus 40, is change in velocity is negative 70 meters per second. That's important. If you understand that concept, give me a thumbs up. If you are unclear about that, now would be a good time to raise your hand or wave it around so I can say, say it again. All right. We're good? We're good. All right. What is the change in momentum? Maybe I should bring up the picker wheel. 
So we just determined, oh, did they focus? It's like, no, please. So we have a uh, 0 0.350 kilogram. The velocity going in is plus 40 meters per second. Alexa, stop. The velocity going out is negative 30 meters per second. The mass is still 0 0.30 kilograms. We want to know what the change in momentum is. You can pick away. You can multiply mass times change in velocity. You can find the momentum going in, the momentum coming out, and subtract. You pick. Take a minute. We got five of them. So if you do the second one that you said, uh, mm -hmm. it's final minus initial. Always. Yep. Always final minus initial. <laughs> and final is going to be negative, right? Uh, yes. So it's, be a negative it's, it's traveling in the opposite direction. All right. I've had better luck with this one, not picking the same person twice. See? We have a winner! Right. Antonio, what's the change in momentum? Is it negative 24.5? That is exactly what it is. It's negative 24.5. So it comes in at mv, it leaves at mv, and the change in momentum is either m1 v1 final minus m1 v1 initial or mass times the change in velocity or mass times vf minus v either way it's negative 24.5 kilogram meter per second final question What's the impulse imparted to the wall? The impulse is whatever momentum got changed. So if it went in at this value and came out at that value, the change momentum is the impulse. Antonio just said the change of momentum was negative 24.5 kilogram meter per second. So what's the impulse? Negative 24.5 kilo or newton seconds. And then if the collision happened in 0.33 seconds, what was the average force? We take our negative 24.5, we divide by 0.33, and we found the average force is 74.2 newtons. Was the first applied to the wall? Okay, we'll come back to this later. Does the below inelastic collision conserve momentum? Without even calculating anything, yes. Yes, momentum is always conserved. Does it conserve energy? No, it does not conserve energy because it's an inelastic collision. All right, questions? All right, cool. We'll pick this up.